Um, okay. So welcome eligibility and budget review committee members, liaisons and members of the public. Thank you for joining us. We're using Zoom with the goal to foster a more inclusive environment and effective meeting. If you would like to comment during the meeting, please type I have a comment or I have a question in the chat and a message will be sent to the host. Alternatively, you can also use the raise hand feature. In efforts of transparency for all those joining this public meeting, whether by phone or Zoom, we request that you refrain from having side conversations on chat about the content of the meeting. Again, the chat feature is utilized simply as a tool for you to virtually indicate that you would like to speak in order to help the chair facilitate the discussion. A reminder that all Legal Services Trust Fund Commission and committee meetings are recorded and posted to the State Bar website. And a friendly reminder that this is a video conference and please be aware of your surroundings behind you. Great, thanks, Erica. Um, do we think we have enough people? Should we start taking roll call? Yes, I believe we do now. Okay. Um, let me just put up. Okay. Um, Connolly? Here. Akhlagi? Fightmaster? Here. Bennett? Blakemore? Here. Devos? Present. Delfino? Friedman? Ma'am? Here. Meeker? Here. I told? Here. Savage. Okay. Um, we have, we just have quorum. So. And then I will okay. go to our um, liaisons and state bar staff. Great. Um, Selena Copeland. I don't think Selena's here, but I think Zach could be here um, on Selena's behalf. Yeah, hi everybody, Zach Newman from LAC. Thanks, Zach. Um, Bonnie Huff. I'm here, thank you. Christine Ganon. Mark Tony. And then State Bar staff, Dwan Nguyen. Uh, Dwan, I, I think she's here. Um, Elizabeth Hom. Phone. She's by phone. Okay. Um, Chris McConk. Morning, everyone. I'm here. Danielle McRae. Here. And Brady Dewar. Here. Great. Thanks for roll call. Um, why don't we move to public comment? Um, from my understanding, there was a couple people who were intending to do public comment um, and that are relevant to issues that we're going to be discussing today. So um, to the extent that, um, why don't we see who's here for public comment? We, but we may suggest that you do the discussion during the, when, when we actually take up your particular matters, if that's okay. But let me you. see. Yes, I yeah. agree. But let's see who's here first, just to make sure. There's um, Betty Norwood, Martina Lim, and Pablo Ramirez. I can allow okay. Betty. Okay, so um, Betty, my understanding is that you're for to discuss the audit extension request, and my suggestion is that if you don't mind, we'll we'll have you speak when we consider that matter. Um, and then Martina, if, is Betty, is that okay? Oh, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. Great. And um, Ms. Lynn, Martina, um, I was going to suggest the same thing about the eviction defense collaboratives um, request um, regarding qualified expenditures. Is that okay with you? Absolutely. Thank you. Awesome. And then who's the, the, the third person? Pablo Ramirez. Okay. Pablo, I don't know. Um, if you want to make your public comment now, or if it's on a particular matter on our agenda, which would be better for you to discuss at that time. I'm just observing, um, no public comment to that. I have an interest. I'm just kind of curious on the results. Oh, okay, great. Thanks. All right. 
So with that, if is there any other member of the public that would like to make comment? It doesn't, nobody else is raising their hand. So. Okay, great. Um, why don't we then move to um, the consent of the meeting minutes from the past couple of meetings. Does anybody move have any? Move to accept. Both of them or? Oh. Okay, any, can, any objections or discussion necessary? Hearing none, do we have a second? I'll second. Okay. Thank you. Um, Connolly? Yes. Foggy? Fightmaster? Yes. Bennett? Yes. Blakemore? Yes. Dippos? Yes. Delfino? Um, Friedman? <clears throat> Mann? Yes. Uh, Meeker? Yes. Lantel? Yes. Savage? Yeah. Um, that Great. Okay. I think the next thing on our agenda is um, a review of the support center deeming results. So I'll let Erica take that away. I'm going to go dark for just a couple minutes while I shift to a different location. Give me one sec. Sure. So just a, a brief update on support center deeming. So um, as you all may know, support centers provide um, legal training, technical assistance, and advocacy support to QLSPs. Um, in the statute, it says that if the organization was in existence prior to December 31st, 1980, it's presumed eligible. If um, it came into existence after that date, it needs to be deemed of special need. And so the way our office administers that is every three years, um, a support center needs to be voted um, as a, being deemed of special need by the QLSPs, the Qualified Legal Services Project. So we sent out a survey over the summer um, results came in on August 3rd. The four organizations that were being deemed this year were California Advocates for Nursing Home Reform, uh, California Women's Law Center, Public Interest Law Project, and WorkSafe. Um, and all four of them were, were deemed of special need. We sent it out to 78 qualified legal services projects and received um, 67 responses. In order to be deemed, um, the organization needed to receive a minimum of 40 votes, which would be majority, um, and they all exceeded that. So, um, so they've all been deemed um, and are still uh, being recommended as eligible by staff. Great, thanks for the update. Does anybody have any questions or anything to discuss with Erica about the results? Okay. Seeing none, why don't we move to our next agenda item, which is the final audits received and any remaining audit financial review issues. Um, and so Erica, why don't you give us an overview and then we can have um, uh, Betty Nordwind provide her public comment. Is that, if that works for everybody. So at the committee's June meeting, uh, we discussed late um, audits that didn't come in in time um, by the extension date that staff was allowed to grant, which was through May 31st. Um, after discussion, the committee granted uh, six extensions and then delegated authority to Erica Connolly to meet with two more organizations to determine whether their audit extension was appropriate or not. Um, the date for the audit extension was August 2nd. That was the final date for all organizations to submit. Um, all organizations that were granted an extension um, met that August 2nd deadline, except for Harriet Buhai Center for Family Law. Um, also, after um, Erica Connolly met with the two organizations that were seeking an extension, um, she granted the extension for uh, Center for Human Rights and Constitutional Law, which was the letter that we um, attached to the meeting materials today. Um, in the case of um, family legal assistance at Chalk Children's, that organization has essentially stopped proceeding with the, um, the application process. And so an extension was not granted because they, they no longer sought one. Um, so in the case um, 
as I said, everybody submitted by August 2nd, except for Harriet Buhai. Um, I think Betty would like to provide some more information about that. But, um, you know, my understanding was that there was some difficulty in ascertaining whether that organization would need a single audit this year based on their receipt of federal funds. Um, and that took some time to sort out. Um, but we have received the final audit um, this week and I've reviewed it. Um, and I believe that, um, you know, everything conforms to the draft that we had received previously. So um, staff would recommend accepting their, their late audit um, in order for them to continue in the application process. Great. Thanks, Erica. Ms. Nordwin, do you want to provide your public comment now? Um, I'm not sure if you if you started, but we still I still see you as mute. Okay, go. sorry. <laughs> no, um, no, no problem. <laughs> okay, drive run. Um, first of all, thank you all for your service. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I will keep this very short. You know, they say when you're in front of the judge and you're slightly ahead keep it short. So um, first, I do want to extend my apologies on behalf of the Harriet Buey Center for the late audit. Um, we believe it is an aberration. Um, as Erica uh, mentioned, there were both very specific reasons which she detailed and slightly more general reasons, which I will go into very briefly. At full disclosure, the person who should be speaking today is our deputy director who handles all our finance. She's on a very well-deserved well and very needed vacation. So um, I, I am, she is more, much more well-versed in the facts. The immediate um, issue um, is that, as Erica said, the general audit is on the coattails of a single audit, which is the bigger audit. Uh, there was a lot of question about some of the federal funding and how it got classified, and we wanted to classify it um, so that we did not have to do the single audit because it's a much bigger deal, but they, our accountants couldn't get uh, couldn't get a reading from, I guess, the federal funders as to how they could declare it. It was very technical issues, but it was also exacerbated by our underlying stress from the pandemic in terms of um, being really need to changing our operations. Our deputy director, who, who I mentioned, is both the IT person and the CFO. And uh, she had an enormous amount on her plate and still does, um, which I am sure also delayed just the beginning of the audit process. So it's not like for a year and a half, we've been trying to get an answer from the federal government. I think it was exacerbated by um, a later start. Um, I think, as I said, we're, this was an aberration. We're a really solid program. Um, our finances are squeaky clean. Um, we're looked over, monitored all the time by the County of LA. I'm happy to answer any other questions if you have at this time. I don't wanna take any more of your time. Thank you, Ms. Nordwind. Um, does anyone from the committee have any questions for Ms. Nordwind? Okay, any- How old is the organization? 1982. And we're one of the largest, probably the largest comprehensive family law programs in the state with probably the largest volunteer program for true family law volunteers in the state. So we have a really essential role in, in the delivery of legal services in California. Any other questions? Um, and the audit has since been submitted, right, Erica? Correct. And any, right, and no, we have, are there any concerns about it? 
No, um, they had submitted a draft audit previously and the final is consistent with the draft. So. Okay. Anybody else have any discussion or questions or anything we wanna discuss on this? I don't see any. Uh, it's Catherine. I would move that we accept the um, late audit. Okay. Do we have a second? I'll second that, Bob Plantold. Okay. Thank you. Um, Connolly? Yes. Beth Bloggy? Fightmaster? Yes. Bennett? No. Blakemore? Yes. Jabez? Yes. Delfino? Yes. Friedman? And? Yes. Meeker? Yes. Plantel? Yes. Savage? The motion passes. Okay. Okay, thank you, Ms. Nordwin, for your time and making your public comment. Um, why don't we move to the next thing on our agenda, um, which Thank you. is, Thank oh you. yeah, <laughs> which I'm is gonna... the um, eviction defense collaboratives request. Um, again, I'm gonna have Erica Carroll give us kind of an overview and then um, Ms. Lim, we can, we welcome any public comment. Um, so eviction defense collaborative had submitted a request to include its rental assistance disbursement component services as part of its legal services qualified expenditures for the 2022 application. Um, this is um, a unit of the organization that provides rental assistance, um, negotiates with landlords, um, helps tenants avoid eviction um, through the use of rental assistance and through materials submitted by Eviction Defense Collaborative, um, you know, they have posited that this is part of their legal services, that it's uh, frequently in consultation with their director of uh, litigation and policy, um, and that it should be included as qualified expenditures. And um, after the last meeting in July, uh, staff was asked to follow up with Eviction Defense Collaborative to get some more information about the structure of the program, um, their expenditures related to specific activities, um, as well as just sort of a fuller explanation of their position. So um, EDC submitted that letter that was included with your meeting materials, um, as well as the addendum that I sent out yesterday, um, indicating the breakdown of their, their expenditures. Um, and, um, you know, I, I think that Martina, um, you know, can probably speak more to the specifics of the program or the questions that were were asked um, at the last meeting as far as as how um, this would be considered legal services. But um, you know, I think um, some of the questions that came up were were what aspect um, of the program is more administrative duties versus actually you know working with attorneys or negotiating, um, as well as um, you know, whether this is an argument for this year, given the circumstances of COVID, or whether this would be um, something that the organization would seek to include as their, as legal services in the future, um, the answer to which is that EDC has always maintained that this should be included as legal services, um, but that they have deducted it in the past, um, given staff's interpretation or direction at the time that that wasn't uh, considered legal services. So, um, Great. Uh, thank you, Erica. Um, Brady, I see your hand is raised. Do you want to talk before we have uh, public comment or? I was just, um, yeah. if it's full, going to ask um, um, before Martina speaks, um, just two, two things I'd like to hear addressed. Um, number one, and I think I know the answer to this, but I just want to be clear that under any of the scenarios, um, they're not asking for our funds to be used actually as the rental assistance. Um, it's just for staff time. So I wanted to make that clear. And then the second, it, it seems like there's sort of trying to follow the correspondence, three alternatives. One is none of it counts. One is some of it counts and one is all of it counts. And I, I guess um, sort of beyond the tables if, if um, Martina could provide um, uh, just an explanation of, of what are the difference, I guess, between the, 
um, the sum of it and all of it. What, what was taken out to get to, I think, the smaller number of 600,000. Okay. Thanks, Brady. Um, so Martina, why don't you go ahead and make your comment and then we'll open it up to questions from the rest of the committee um, and obviously keeping you know, Brady's questions in mind, seeing as how he's from our, our Office of General Counsel. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, thank you so much for this opportunity um, to be here today and speak regarding the impact of the rental assistance disbursement component on EDC's legal services. I'm going to be up front and just answer your question, Brady. Um, no, we are not seeking to have any IOLTA funds applied towards RADCO. We would only apply IOLTA funds towards our litigation program or our intake services program. Um, I hope that um, answers the first one. And um, as Erica um, has said that EDC um, has posited that we do believe that our RADCO um, services do qualify as part of the expenses attributable to legal services. Um, we submitted this app that we, when we submitted our application this year, we believe that the circumstances and demands of the past year opened the door to these conversations regarding equity. And we also believe that the unique circumstances were such that um, the interrelatedness of the services that we are providing under RADCO um, and the legal services that we're providing that are clearly um, historically understood as legal services, that that was more visible and more evident to individuals outside of the nonprofit world. Um, and so for that reason, we did posit the, in our application this year, what we posited of all of rental assistance disbursement component services qualify as legal services. Um, as I have stated in the written submissions to the commission, we posit this, or we believe this for two reasons. One, the legislature clearly stated its intent to improve and expand upon the quality of legal services that are provided to indigent persons. And also because providing legal serv services to indigent persons necessitates a greater breadth of services than as compared to what would be required in providing legal services to individuals with, with privilege, privilege of wealth, language, mobility, and access to justice. EDC success is based on the marriage of our legal services and our rental assistance. RADCO is a key component of the legal assistance that we provide, as well as the limited and full scope representation um, that are provided to 90% of the tenants being evicted in San Francisco. So not just EDC full, uh, full scope representation, but throughout the tenant right to counsel system. For example, recently RADCO was able to coordinate with EDC's litigation team in a matter involving a stay of execution. The litigation team was able to procure a court order staying the execution of a pre moratorium judgment, but this stay is entirely conditioned on the tenant's ability to pay the um, pay for the rent period. Without Radco, the indigent tenant would have been unable to, to secure a positive outcome as the stay was entirely contingent upon the tenant's ability to pay. So this is an example of how Radco's services are a key part of the success of EDC services. Um, applying an overly narrow definition of the expenditures attributable to legal services in the context of legal services to indigent persons perpetuates the system of inequity that the legislature sought to address. This is a system that played an integral role in someone meeting the definition of indigent and their need for free legal services. It also ignore this narrow interpretation also ignores the reality of what being an indigent person in the United States means and the myriad services that are required in order to adequately meet indigent person's needs, stabilize their, stabilize their lives, and or achieve a truly successful outcome to their legal issue. In other words, the myriad services attributable to providing indigent person legal services. With all that being said, EDC does understand the unique circumstances of the global pandemic and understand that what we are proposing is a novel uh, interpretation of what is a qualifying expenditure. Um, and so although we initially did um, put in our application that 100% of the services that are provided under RADCO constitute legal services in an effort to um, just, again, understanding the circumstances, we did uh, provide an alternative calculation. And this alternative calculation, what it includes is the time that was spent by RADCO staffing consulting with attorneys and assisting with the legal clinic with intakes. 
um, RADCO and San Francisco Tenant Right to Council cross trainings that inform the provision of services under Senate, uh, San Francisco's Tenant Right to Council system, as well as negotiations with property managers in order to preserve the tenancies and or prevent homelessness. Um, that is all for my public comment. I'm not sure if I fully addressed your question though, Brad, so I'm happy to answer any direct questions regarding that. Uh, thanks, Ms. Lim. Um, and so I'll open it up now to questions from the committee and staff. And it looks like, Bob, you have your hand raised. Thank you. Um, I've been a resident of San Francisco for years, so I'm familiar outside their scope of services, familiar with EDC. Um, I'll ask first uh, the staffer, but then maybe ask if our council is willing to weigh in on my question, which is, in the beginning of the presentation, we heard about this being specific to San Francisco. Since we're a statewide funding agency, how relevant, how applicable, how easy is it for us to um, authorize uh, allocation of funds to something that's, if you will, San Francisco specific in terms of the, the rental, in terms of the other aspects that were in, the other aspects of the expenses that were in question. Um, it, are, are we making a special case exemption, which then might allow for Bakersfield or, or Eureka or Susanville or um, Anaheim to come up with their own separate um, special case exemptions? I'll leave it like that. And again, if, if Brady or the chair of our committee wants to weigh in after uh, EDC staff, please do so. Thank you. Well, I'll just jump in. We're not, we're not um, no, but the question is whether um, whether the, uh, the, um, mm -hmm. the RADCO expenses are, are legal services under our definition. So we're not, I don't think we're being asked to make an exemption or a localized exemption. So um, I, I, I would say um, no, if I understand the question. Okay, never mind. Thank yeah, you. I think I think Bob, though, to your point, um, maybe is that is that to the extent that what EDC does in San Francisco, other organizations may do in their own particular counties, they would likely be able to and we approve it, they would likely be able to um, make the same argument if there are separate, you know, it wouldn't be a special exemption, but it would, it potentially could impact other organizations in other counties. Correct, Brady? If, right? Yeah. And okay. I, if that's what you're getting at. And I, I just want to um, make um, one more lawyerly observation. Um, I, I hope it's not too uh, picky. Um, we need to be talking about, um, you know, the analysis is under our definition um, whether these are, are legal services, um, I know, and the, the statute is complicated, so um, that uh, the letter from Eviction Defense Collaborative um, focuses on, on this language, um, expenditures attributable to the representation of indigent persons um, from uh, subdivision, from Business Professions Code 6216, B1A, um, you know, I don't know that there wasn't any any intent um, for that to be broader than our um, standard, you know, expenditures must be on legal services. But even to the extent that it was, um, that clause only applies to law school programs. So, um, so the real question here is um, whether they are legal services under the definition that we've we've used and promulgated. Okay, thanks, Brady, for the clarification as well. Uh, Jim, I see your hand raised, and then Sahara. Uh, yeah, I have a question for Brady or other staff. I was just wondering, are there other examples where <clears throat> organizations are allowed to account as expenditures activities that they cannot use IOLTA funds for? The closest well, thing I can think of is the issue of social workers. We've talked about that before, where some organizations pay for social workers to be on the team that addresses the client's problems. I don't know if those expenditures are counted, and I don't know if IOLTA funds can go to the say the pay the salary of a social worker. Well, you know, this this came up in the um, expungement area, and and we're um, hopefully clarifying that 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 there aren't there shouldn't be 
there aren't separate definitions in, in, in our practice, there, there isn't. So that, that uh, example of social work that's directed by the um, attorneys, where we've allowed that, that is both a qualified expenditure and something that you can spend the money on. So, um, you know, our analysis um, really needs to be, if they're legal services, what they're asking for, it's qualified expenditures and they can spend the, spend the, the funds on it. They don't have to, uh, they can spend the funds on any of their legal services, but, um, but there's not really a separate definition, no. Okay. So I would think to be consistent with that practice that to the extent that they're using some of these, that they're using the rental assistance that they're providing funds to the client, that that wouldn't count as expenditures, but to the extent that they are having staff that are advising or helping to draft things that that would count. Right? Correct. And I guess uh, that's a clarification I should get from Martina. Um, my understanding now is that they are not seeking to use the actual funds that go out the door towards landlords as settlements or, or rental payments, they're not seeking to use those as qualified expenditures either. Is that correct, Martina? Absolutely. Okay. 100%. Got it. So you're only going to use, you're only asking for like salaries, staff time. That's what you're requesting. Correct. Got it. Okay. Correct. As qualified yeah. expenditures. Right. Yes. And, and would, if we, deem it as qualified expenditures would also qualify for IELTS to, to pay for. Yes, it would. Yeah, it, correct. It would qualify, yeah. but that is not what EDC would be using the funds for. We'd be using the funds to um, increase support to um, sure. for tenant right to counsel. Right. But we're sort of thinking yeah, yeah, as no. far as what permissible versus you know, 100, what you budgeted for. 100%. Yes. Understood. Got it. Okay. Zahira, you have your hand raised. Yes, thank you. Um, so my question is um, kind of connected to some of like the prior questions um, in terms of how far does this, you know, open up? Um, you know, I think that with respect to the other things that occur within an organization um, that are part of the other activities as they're providing legal services, I, I, I'm just curious in terms of like what, what this opens up um, with respect to, to everything everything else. Because if it's expenses attributable, we, we've, we've sort of discussed this with prior organizations. If, if, a ter if, if something is happening within the organization where they're providing legal services and there is something that's occurring that is part of, could be handled by, is handled by a non-lawyer and, and kind of falls outside of, the scope of exactly what is the provision of legal services. It's, it's as we have these, these conversations, and I guess this is what we're struggling with each time, is how much of it is actually kind of necessary and vital and is towards the provision of legal services. You know, if, if there's a paralegal who's working on something um, and is putting together a package for litigation that's occurring or for other activities that are occurring, that seems a little bit clearer. In other cases where we're talking about efforts that are occurring because someone has gone to seek legal services, um, you know, just how far, how, how much are we opening up the, um, the door in terms of what qualifies um, as we're having these conversations? Because, you know, to, to the point of the organization, I mean, they did kind of talk about this as being I think um, kind of like a novel or, um, you know, kind of like distinct understanding. And I, I just wonder if we're, if we're currently under the circumstances to be able to accept too many of those or any of those as we're thinking about not just like budgeting in terms of legal services, but what is the level of equity that we're providing across the state that allows other organizations to seek resources for the same type of work. Um, but I, I would just like to have a better understanding because it, it's a little bit unclear to me about how, how much we're opening up the door to, to other bodies of work. I'm, I'm not sure if that's a question that's directed at me, but what I'd like to clarify um, is the nature of the, of the services that we, are that we have presented in our alternative calculation. Um, the, the, the services that we have included are, are actually 
um, when our RADCO staff are consulting with attorneys or when they are um, assisting with the legal intake clinic. Um, we are also including um, negotiation, property, uh, negotiations with property managers and landlords that are meant to preserve the tenancies and to pre prevent homelessness. And we've also included um, the, the, the nominal compared to the rest of the, of the other two um, categories of services, the cross trainings that are occur between our Radico component and attorneys, not just within EDC, but also throughout the entire system. So this is um, a coordination of efforts throughout the entire system of the tenant right to counsel system. And these cross trainings really do inform the way that the services are being provided the legal services, the unquestionable full scope representation of clients. They, they directly inform that work and they do directly inform the way that RADCO negotiates with landlords and property managers um, and the way that they approach um, a need or a client's case, as well as their understanding of um, uh, what to have in mind when they are consulting with an attorney, what to bring to the table for those, con for those consultations. I'm not sure if that um, directly addresses your question. I do think that um, the services that we're talking about, they would be provided by, they, they, they often are provided by paralegals. The difference with, um, with EDC in this, in this case is we have to separate the RADCO component program in order to ensure that um, we are not, uh, not having a, um, a conflict, we're not creating conflict of interest issues with all of the clients who come to us for referrals and we're, that we're not, um, we're not uh, breaking any, any rules with respect to um, talking to a represented litigant. So this is one of the reasons that we do have this completely separate, but I have, I have worked at many places where a paralegal does negotiate with a manager or a landlord um, on behalf of an attorney. So the work that is being done is very much work that is often done by paralegals. Thank you for that, Ms. Lim. And, and uh, that question was actually directed to staff, um, but thank you for, for weighing in on that. Um, and if, if, you, if you don't mind. Um, so yeah, with that, you know, would love to hear from you, Brady, a bit on that. And then also to the point that Ms. Lim just made with respect to um, those instances where the RADCO staff, part of what they're doing is having conversations, it sounds like, um, to not violate any rules about speaking with represented parties. It, it's not clear to me how that would be legal services. If you are having someone speak on your behalf to a represented party, that would necessarily exclude it from being a legal service um, because your attorney cannot then direct someone else to have a conversation with a represented party. But you know, I, I'd love to hear your thoughts, Brady. And Ms. Lim, if you would um, just please allow Brady to, to continue, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm having a hard time visualizing, um, looking at your three bullets here, um, although that, that was an interesting point that Sahira just, just raised that, that, you know, it, it can't be directed by an attorney if the reason you're doing it is to, to, for these negotiations to be completely separate from, from the attorney, um, I guess I see I see better your argument here for these this this alternative. What 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 is included in the um, in the larger calculation um, of qualified expenditures that's not included here, and are any of those services provided to to somebody who walks in the door without a threat of eviction? But it's more I'm going to have a hard time paying my rent this month. Can I get some? assistance. Um, so to the second question first, no, the, the services that are provided are for individuals who are under threat of eviction um, for RADCO services. Uh, to the like, first- they, Like literally have received a, a threat of, a, 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 some proceedings have been initiated or- Or a notice has been received. Yes. Um, that's what the, um, there are some instances where we know that if they do not pay their rent, they will be evicted. And particularly right now with COVID, we know, for example, that there are very limited protections. And so while they may not have received a threat of eviction right now because of the moratoria, 
we know that when the moratoria are lifted, if they do not pay a certain percentage of the rent, they will be under threat of eviction. And so some of this is, is again, this is somewhat unique in, in the context of COVID is wow. because of the moratoria, um, we are preventing in some instances, the immediate threat of eviction that's going to take place when the moratoria is lifted. And um, this is on some way it's uh, logistical because if we didn't do it now, then we would have, I don't even know how many thousands upon, upon thousands of individuals who would be immediately evictable um, come October 3rd. Uh, so, so there is that. Um, as to the first question, what we have excluded um, based on, you know, with the, um, under the, you know, we've, we've spoken with, with staff and what we have understood to be one of the difficulties of the, of our, of our position is that the services that are being provided by our RADCO staff are being provided under a general understand, a general um, interpretation that is provided by the Director of Litigation and Policy. For example, every time the moratoria would change with respect to what needed to be paid, what doesn't need to be paid, how do you, how do you avoid the eviction when the moratoria is lifted, every time that happened, which was I think every two weeks, um, there would, be, there would have to be an, another analysis. What does this mean? What do all of the myriad moratoria working together mean with respect to what an individual needs to do or pay in order to avoid an immediate eviction, in order to be immediately evictable. Um, and so this was constantly changing and constantly, um, the, the director of lit litigation and policy would regularly is meeting with the program manager for RADCO, providing this information and this understanding. RADCO is informing the director of litigation and policy, what is happening on the ground level. So it was part of the services that were excluded were those that we believe relate to um, uh, serve, the provision of services under the umbrella of the, the, the direction of the, the director of litigation and policy with respect to their interpretation of what was needed from the perspective of a rental assistance to avoid immediate eviction. Does that? And you were excluding that because it was our understanding um, after consulting with um, other individuals that that might have been the trickiest uh, or the most novel of interpretations of uh, the provision of legal services. And for that reason, while I do believe it is because it is directly under the guidance of an existing staff member who is regularly updating, I, I, EDC does continue to believe that that does constitute legal services. But for purposes of this conversation in recognition of everything that's at stake and all the, the many decisions that are being made right now, we wanted to back that out um, in the hopes that that could be part of a future conversation. So the difference is, let me see if I can paraphrase that, that those services are, are really, they're the attorney or the director of litigation saying, oh, here's how the situation, here's how the moratorium have changed without looking at any of these individual cases, um, here's what the new rules are. And yes. then you go ahead and, and um, get the assistance that's needed. Gotcha. Exactly, yeah. Um, now on the biggest chunk under the alternative calculation, um, sort of addressing um, Zahira's comment, how do those property manager landlord negotiations in order to preserve tenancies or prevent homelessness, what do those look like and what, if any involvement from an attorney is there? Well, in large part, it has to do with the fact that the RADCO coordinators are trained specifically in eviction defense and eviction defense negotiations. So the training that they receive has a lot to do, how they, appro uh, how they approach these negotiations comes from the perspective and training of um, an eviction defense attorney. The way, and a large part of this also um, arises because Radco, having been around for I think now 18 years or so, has a long-standing relationship with many landlords and property managers. And for this reason, they are able, Radco coordinators are in a position where they're able to reach out directly to a landlord or a property manager and say, listen, let's let's figure this out, let's work this out together. Will a promissory note from from Radco get this going, uh, lift this threat of eviction? 
um, they will talk with the, the property manager and landlord about um, the payments that are owed and how payments can be made. Um, they do what they can to minimize the threat or remove the, the immediate threat of eviction and um, negotiate so that you can avoid the eviction being filed to begin with. Uh, thank you, Ms. Lim. I think we'll go Pamela and then Bob, and then I have a question slash comment that I'd like to make after the, those two. Pamela? Okay, I'll just keep it brief. My question was um, housing.ca.gov. Uh, the government is providing rental assistance to individuals throughout Northern and Southern California. And so how does their uh, program vary from what the state is already doing? Um, so that would be my question. How is their program varying from what the state is already providing to individuals? You mean EDC's program? Yes, their program versus mm -hmm. what the state is already providing for residents. Ms. Lim, do you have a... Yes, absolutely. Well, the, the federal program that's in place in California is very limited in terms of duration of time and who qualifies or doesn't qualify. EDC's RADCO component is not limited in that respect. That being said, um, the funds that EDC disperses, one, they've been ongoing for years, but also um, these are funds that are being dispersed under the direction of the city of San Francisco, as in um, departments from the city of San Francisco provide a significant, provide all of these funds actually that are being dispersed and provide the guidance but the guidance is informed by RADCO and EDC with their knowledge and understanding of what eviction defense, uh, of how rental assistance um, relates with eviction defense and um, informs the policies that the city will is taking in, in terms of who does or doesn't qualify and the type of rental assistance that will be given. Um, so it is different. Um, it is separate and apart from it. It is not something that uh, is, it, it, it was in existence prior to that. Um, so I, I'm, yeah, it, it's, it, it's definitely different from it, um, but it is also very, very similar to it. Um, uh, and we are actually working with the state program in conjunction to try to work together to minimize uh, the need to minimize the confusion and to minimize the multiple applicate people needing to file multiple applications everywhere. Thanks, Ms. Lim. Um, Bob, your question? You're on mute, Bob. Sorry. Her recent comments answered the question I was going to ask. So, never mind. Thank you. Okay. Um, I have a I have a question, Ms. Lim. I, you know, somewhat I'm gonna pick up the baton a little bit from Zahira. Like I'm a little concerned that you're kind of in this rock and hard place in some ways because it seems to me that the services that the Radco people are providing can't be done by lawyers because you are not you don't want them, you want to sort of bypass the representation issue. And it seems as if you're sort of walling them off. And we have, and I'll defer to Brady on this, but we've generally tried to keep legal services to be something that lawyers need to be involved with, um, supervise. And so it, it seems to me as if the kinds of work that they're doing may be very helpful to your clients. And, um, you know, but, but given that, that, that separation that you're, you've put into place and the fact that it seems as if you don't have lawyers supervising them in their particular um, negotiations so that you don't have to worry about many of the um, professional responsibility requirements that lawyers have. It, you know, I, I am concerned about sort of saying that that is legal services. Um, and, you know, I wanted to just kind of maybe, maybe there's something I'm missing here. Um, you know, whereas I think we, we have tried to be, I think, not as narrow as, as maybe your um, letter had attributed to us, where we have, you know, I think approved interpreters, social workers, but those, 
services are generally done under the supervision of the attorney who's running the particular case so that they sort of dovetail more naturally with the case itself. And so I, and, and again, staff may correct me on this. There may be something different, but I, I just, there's something I think a little bit in tension for me or in conflict about you wall them off, but they're still really helpful for the case. They're not under the supervision of an attorney, but it's still legal services. And that, that I will just express that as my concern and Ms. Lim, you're, you know, you're welcome to make some comments in response. Thank you. And I, I understand your concern. I really do. I, I don't want to in any way, shape or form say that that's not, and I understand um, uh, Zahira, I, I also recognize the point that you made. One of the ways that I have interpreted and understood the work that is being done by RADCO is under the, the as quasi-judicial, very similar to the work that is being done by our shelter client advocates. Yes, they are being um, supervised by a directing attorney, but the work that they're doing is not advocating on behalf of, an, an, uh, of a law that is in place, but rather um, is uh, working with uh, shelter shelters and shelter clients in an effort to enforce a, um, uh, a policy that is in place with the city of San Francisco, much like what RADCO is trying to do. They are seeking to uh, provide assistance and services to clients who are, be, who are about to be evicted because of a law that is in place. And they're trying to provide services to avoid that, um, that legal, uh, the legal measures that are about to be taken, um, taken by the property managers or the landlords. And so while I understand, that is how I have always understood it. And the reason I understand it this way is because this program exists for the sole purpose of supporting the legal services that are taking place, of supporting the, um, the uh, tenants' efforts to avoid the eviction. Um, and every aspect of this program was developed and created. It was developed and created by lawyers. It, used, it was initially supervised by lawyers. It has since grown um, to a degree that it is no longer supervised by lawyers, but it is, it, it is a program that evolved from lawyers understanding that in order to be successful with, with any of the legal services, whether it's pro per legal services, full scope representation legal services, there was a missing component for tenants of San Francisco. And that missing component was rental assistance. And so this program was born out of a necessity to improve the outcomes of the legal services received by tenants in San Francisco. Um, okay, I'll turn it, I'll let Dwan and Bonache uh, make their respective comments and then I, I may have another follow-up question, but go ahead, Dwan. Yeah, um, Zara, Erica, I, I, you know, I share your concerns about being the walled off, but I do wanna point out with the social workers, um, you know, they're subject to their own kind of confidentiality um, rules and so forth. And so there are some programs that we fund that we allow that are very walled off, some are less. Um, so we have kind of allowed that. And I don't know for me personally that I, I, I see where you're coming from and I, sh I, I share that concern, but I think the, the way that EDC kind of itemized it out, the, um, the four categories, the first one being the consultation with the attorneys, that, that, that category to me seems um, uh, you know, very qualifying to me. If it's somebody coming in and they need rental assistance and then they're consulting with their policy director on a, a live legal issue, that seems to me like a very strong nexus um, part of the legal services. So that that's a category um, I think um, the staff um, and Erica and I have talked about this, that we, we feel comfortable um, with the recommendation, at least for that 200 something thousand, that that would be qualifying. The other pieces I, I have to, um, it, it's something that I don't know if uh, eligibility and budget review committee has the time in this meeting to kind of delve into. I would suggest um, that's a rules committee to really, really dive deep into that and see how we, how other programs do it. I think it's just such a large issue. Um, it creates a little bit of a, a slippery slope, um, but the 200 and, and I think 39,000 for the consultation that feels a bit more comfortable um, on the staff end. Okay, thanks, Dwan. Uh, Bonifshay? 
Uh, thank you. Uh, just picking up on Duan's slippery slope, uh, that's, that's actually what's been going through my mind as I've been listening uh, to this discussion. Um, thank you so much for coming, Mrs. Lam, and thank you for the work that you all are doing. Obviously, more than ever, as um, you've mentioned, you, your, your services are in need. Um, and of course, we support those services. But my, my concern, and I think what you might be hearing from my colleagues, is that th there seems to be a, um, a widening of the scope of what we fund, what, our, uh, what, what we're looking for, for qualifying. And it seems as though there might be something close to about $700,000 that's, uh, that's in question that we're trying to wrap our heads around. So if we were to uh, look at those categories that Duan just mentioned of the four categories, one of them, of course, um, as she just spoke to, could you walk us through, and I think Brady was trying to get to this and maybe Zahira was trying to get to this. We're having a, we're having a challenge with the other three categories um, to be able to, to have it rise to qualifying. Is there anything that you could you could add there for us other than what you've already shared? And with respect to the other three categories, you're referring to the services that are provided under the umbrella uh, directives from the from the director of litigation and policy, the negotiations and the cross trainings. Is that? Yes. Okay. I mean, uh, other than what I have already provided, I don't know that I can provide any more. I, I do understand. <laughs> The, um, the concern of this being, I do understand the concern that this may be a broadening. Um, I, I, well, I believe that these are necessary components to the work that is done at EDC. I believe that these are necessary components to the legal services that are provided, not just at EDC, but in all of San Francisco. And so um, while I understand the concern, I do think that, this is not as much a broadening as um, just bringing, bringing, bringing up the reality of what the legal services organizations have to do in order to secure a successful outcome. We have consistently had to go outside of just providing legal services in the um, historical way of defining legal services in order to be effective. And this is one of those mechanisms by which EDC has improved upon and ensured a greater uh, success for its for tenants throughout San Francisco. Thank you. Um, Zahira? <clears throat> Thank you. Um, and just to echo um, my colleagues, you know, a lot of appreciation for the work that you are doing um, and how it's moving forward. And well, you know, I, I kind of just, um, it's more of a, of, of a comment um, with respect to these different pieces of work and then also kind of building on what um, Duan was sharing earlier. Uh, the, the continued piece that, that uh, you know, I'm struggling with is yes, this broadening of the work, but then also um, in, um, you know, Commissioner Conley also kind of mentioned this, this piece in terms of, you know, funding something as legal services that an attorney is not only can't, is not doing, but is prohibited from doing. And so to fund something under that category where yes, they were trained by attorneys. Yes, this piece seems to exist because it was developed in concert with attorneys. And now as they move forward, the prohibition in terms of how attorneys interact with represented counsel to have another kind of body and, and group of people who do that work, but then to call it legal services um, I, I, and be funded by the state bar. I just, I'm, I'm having a, a hard time reconciling that. Um, and the formation of the work and how it came about, um, I, I don't know if that kind of imbues it for the rest of its duration of the quality of the work because attorneys were involved in the initial formation and the training and the setting up of the efforts. And I also appreciate that some of, there are lots of things that are, you know, I think um, 
Ms. Lynn, what you kind of refer to are elements of work that are necessary, um, that are really necessary in terms of um, the needs for the community, necessary in terms of the work for your specific organization. Um, and there are a number of legal services organizations that do work that's necessary for the work of their organizations, but they don't come under like kind of a qualified expenses that we're talking about in this particular instance, because organizations have lots of other components of their efforts that they're moving forward. However, they've designed their particular nonprofits to work. And so th th that's the piece where I just continue to be concerned about the positioning of this, the broadening of this. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I definitely appreciate the work, um, but, you know, that kind of remains, remains my concern. And, and thus far, I haven't, you know, heard anything in particular that, that continue, that addresses sort of that issue. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it there in terms of my comment, but thank you for allowing space. Thanks, Sarah. Um, Jim, you have a, your hand raised? Uh, yeah, in, uh, in light of uh, Duan's comment, I, and, and perhaps my problem is I'm not a practicing attorney, but I just don't follow the argument that this is broadening of what we've been counting as expenditures before. When, when we address the issue of people or, or organizations using social works in the custody context, mm -hmm. meaning that they needed to treat the client in their complete context, not only the specific legals, but also the other problems that they may be having, and we haven't had a problem, if I understood Brady correctly, not only counting expenditures for social workers, but also using IOLTA funds to fund the social workers. I don't see how this particular argument here, again, using the categories that Dewan was, was mentioning earlier in her comments, how we're broadening what we've been doing in the past. Well, I because see Brady's hands raised, so we'll let him. <laughs> Sure, it's, it, because they're under the supervision and control of a licensee of the state bar, and that's rule 3.672 uh, delivery of legal services um, in the state bar rules. So the, the, the problem is the, 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 the wall and separating it from, from um, the legal services directed by an attorney. Uh, Herman, you have your hand raised? Yeah, this is to staff. Based on all the conversation, I, I asked the question, do we fund any organization the way that this organization is asking us to fund them? No, this, this is, a, as Martina suggested, um, mentioned that it's a novel argument. Um, there are a number of other programs that provide cash assistance and um, we've always directed them to, to deduct that. So this would be, um, it's a little complicated because we're so late in the, the, the application cycle. Um, we don't, I mean, the other programs didn't kind of present this. They didn't, they didn't come back to us like the way EDC is and is presenting this argument or have said that we, we don't, we disagree with it. Um, but yeah, we, we haven't um, asked other programs to. So this, this would be starting something new? Well, other programs haven't presented this argument. So, so this would be starting something new? I don't yeah, know how to answer that because they haven't presented yeah. this argument. So I, I so, think though your term and to your point, I think that potentially next year other organizations can make the same request. And just to jump in there, that's my point about the slippery slope and the broadening of this of the scope of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Brady, I just wanted to clarify something as well, actually, on this. Um, is to Dwan's point about social workers and them being walled off. Nevertheless, when we funded them, they've still been under the supervision and in some kind of consultation with an attorney. That's-, yes, that's And I just wanna clarify that too. Um, it, it, sometimes they are walled off, but um, in, in instances, um, the attorney client privilege, Erica pointed this out to me, is protects the social worker, but there are instances that we funded uh, the social worker where they are more walled off. I mean, it's- What do you mean they, by walled off, John? Um, so we had a, I went on a site visit and they said, um, uh, you know, the therapy sessions, they, they don't, they don't share that information with the attorney. Um, there, there's some like supervision at the, the, at the, at the top in terms of coordinating those services, but they don't know kind of the details of that. And then with other programs, they do, they, they sit in a, but, but it's still, on, it's still the attorney saying, oh, go see this, 
you need to you need to see the social worker and work with them. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It's, There's still some coordination at the top. Yeah, it's it's directed by the attorney whether or not the attorney is looking at the files. I don't know how you say it's coordinated. I don't know if directed is the right, but it's coordinated by somebody within the organization. But they've all they they all kind of deal with it differently. Some in some instances with some organizations, you know, they sit at a, a team meeting and they talk about it and they share. It's because the attorney client privilege covers social. It, it's it's all shared. But in other instances, it's not. That's why I mean by in some cases it's more walled off than others. But but I guess it's still the attorneys involved with. Oh, you need to you need to see this therapist. You, you know, you need to. The social yeah, work. I think that's that's the more more common yeah scenario. Okay, Erica, you have a comment, and then at some point we should start to move towards making a decision here because we're running a little short on time. Um, yeah, just to build off of what Juan was saying, um, I'm only aware of two organizations that have that type of model where the client may receive some sort of therapeutic service also within that organization, I would say more often the model is the social worker working in tandem with the legal team to create a plan together about what services need to be provided, whether it may be going to pull a police report, doing court accompaniment to help the client remain calm, um, you know, helping them with public benefits, find housing, whatever it may be. But in most instances, it's um, like a collaborative process together with the attorney or at the direction of the attorney, as Brady was saying. Um, so I would say for a fair instance, the fair, there may be a need for the social worker to wall off, but um, otherwise the normal confidentiality and reporting requirements that would apply to a social worker in other settings do not apply to them um, in the legal services organization because they are under the auspices of legal services. So attorney client privilege would, would apply in that instance. So. Yeah. You know, I, my, my inclination would be that um, if there's a handful that are under this different <laughs> model, we need to look at those more closely rather than using those as a, a, a justification or, or necessity to mm -hmm. um, further depart from the yeah. you know, words of the rule. I agree with you, Brady. Same. Um, okay. Or do we have any last comments or questions for Ms. Lim? Um, or any other comments or questions generally? Okay, hearing none, I think, um, I guess I'm sort of trying to take the temperature. It seems as if um, based on the supplemental uh, addition that there's, you know, consultate, con consulting with attorneys and assisting the legal clinic with intakes, does any, it seems as if we could sort of bracket two different things. One is where there's clearly like work with the attorneys and that's broken out that 200 plus. plus and the, then uh, it cross trainings. And the, and you think the cross trainings make sense? With, with the attorneys, correct? Okay. Yeah, Ms. Lim, they are with the attorneys? Correct, they are with attorneys. Okay, um, but those two seem to be, I think, within our definition. Um, Emma, the, the issue is more of the negotiations that are seem to be walled off. Um, are, does anybody, does anybody wanna make a motion? Are we sort of, are we taking the temperature? I'm trying to get a sense of, are we ready to make, a, make our decision on this? If, have we already heard from staff as to their recommendation? Erica, we haven't, they've been, they have not, we've sort of, yeah, I'll let Erica um, speak. <laughs> our initial recommendation before today's discussion was that we were leaning towards not finding the work qualifying, um, given some of those outstanding questions that I think were, were clarified um, during the discussion, but, um, you know, given, um, you know, the back and forth that's happened now, um, I think we would probably agree with the, the direction it's moving in, in terms of, you know, the, the work that's more squarely involved with legal services or attorneys would, would um, be able to be considered qualifying. Okay. Uh, Bob and then Dwan. Bob, sorry, you're on mute again. Here's the note in the chat to promote 
Brady to panelist. Um, I just wanted to bring that to staff attention. And secondly, th this is a complicated um, possible motion based on what is and what is not going to be part of um, staff training involving attorneys. So I'm going to ask for some sort of direction, guidance, options, whether from staff or council about any possible motion, please. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Bob. Uh, Dawn? Yeah, I was just going to say, um, before the latest supplement that EDC sent over, I believe it was yesterday with the itemized, um, we, weren't, we weren't quite as Erica said, um, convinced, I guess, by, by the, the first supplement, but with the itemization and the discussion today um, and Brady's just last point, I think the, the staff would recommend those those first two categories. So the consultation at 239,000 is some change and then the, the cross training at 26,000 to be um, counted as qualified. Okay. And the other is not qualifying? Um, the not qualifying, I believe, is that 426 that we've been um, talking about in terms of negotiation, the walled off issue. Got it. Erica? Um, just two things quickly. I can bring up the motion on the screen if it'll be easier um, for everyone just to make sure that we're all on the same page. And then the other thing I wanted to mention was that um, I'm not 100% sure, but this, if if this is the deduction that the committee would like to go with, um, it may impact uh, the organization's qualified expenditures to an extent that would drop it below the primary purpose presumption. Um, currently, eviction defense collaborative is at 82%. I haven't run the math just yet. This may bring them down close to 75 or possibly even below it, but my recommendation would be to, to find that they've met primary purpose of providing Free legal services to indigent persons, even if it comes out to be below 75. Okay. Anybody have any objections if we did the craft of the motion that way to find primary purpose, even if they're below the 75? Okay. We see no risk that they're going to go below 50, right? No. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Erica, if you can put the motion, a draft motion up, um, I think that would be the best for us to Move forward. I'm just taking this directly from the letter that was provided by EDC. Um, my only, and I, I will defer to you, to, to you guys and Brady, but I, do we need to be more specific about the sum of, some of their activities to be qualifying legal services? Or like, I'm just wondering if it would be better for us to be a little bit more specific just so that we give guidance both for them and for future organizations. Rather than stating the dollar amount, can we state the types of expenditures that would be deducted, the categorization name in case mm -hmm. of the dollar amount somehow? Yeah, if the, the category name is, um, Erica did add that, but um, I take the point about, you know, to, to Bob's point that maybe we could say direct the following to deduct, yeah. um, expenses that's related yes. to these this particular term. Does that make sense, Bob? Yes, thank you. Mm -hmm. I'll make that motion. Well, wait, I think oh. the, the first clause is, is, is incomplete. Still? Yeah, yeah we just need to add um, so you want to add the categories that are included? Yeah, I think it would be better to be specific, unless other people think it's unnecessary, but... No, Erica, I agree with you. Okay. 
Hey there. Hi, do you have an appointment with someone? Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think this is right. Everybody take a chance, get a chance to review. And then when we're ready, if someone wants to make the motion. So I'll repeat, I'll move this resolution as drafted and shown on our screen. I'll second that. Was that Bon It is, yes. Thank you. Okay. Um, Connolly? Yes. McCloggy? Yes. Dave Muster? Yes. Bennett? Yes. Blakemore? DeBose? Yes. Delfino? Yes. Friedman? Mann? Yes. Meeker? Yes. Plantle? Yes. Savage? The motion passes. Great. Okay. Uh, and again, thank you, Ms. Lim, for uh, coming to speak with us and answering all of our questions. Uh, we really appreciate it. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the invitation and the discussion was incredibly informative. Thank you so much, all of you. Thank you. Um, okay. The next thing on our um, agenda are applications that do not meet presumption of primary purpose is this uh, um, Erica? that was included in in the motion that was just made that was the only one um, oh. that potentially presented that issue so oh, okay great awesome hit two birds with one stone um okay eligibility review conferences we have some discussion on how the outcome of those yes so there were <clears throat> three eligibility review conferences held with um, new applicants, which were Catholic Charities, Diocese of San Diego, um, Community Lawyers Inc., and East Bay Family Defenders um, regarding some eligibility issues that were um, coming up during application review. Um, so all of the, the working groups were comprised of members of the Eligibility and Budget Review Committee <clears throat> and State Bar staff, and we met with um, representatives from each, each agency. Um, so Catholic Charities and um, Chris McConkie was the, the staff person on this one. I'm not sure if he's still on the call, but if he is, he's welcome to join in as well as Catherine Blakemore, Pamela Bennett and Rebecca Delfino who were the working group uh, members. But um, Catholic Charities is uh, an organization in San Diego that provides a sort of what they describe as holistic or wraparound services. They have a variety of, of social services that they offer. Um, and one component of their program is, is legal services, um, namely immigration legal services to indigent persons. Um, it's an organization that reported expenditures of about 13 million last year. Of that, approximately 1 million was devoted to legal services, um, which brings their, their qualified expenditures down to 7% um, of the organization's total expenditures, given that this is only one fraction of of all the services they provide along with, you know, other, um, you know, therapeutic um, services, housing, um, food services and the like. So um, the working group met with the organization because um, Catholic Charities had expressed a desire to talk about primary purpose and demonstrating it by other means. Um, the organization's position is that um, it segregates its legal services expenditures it's not commingled with any of their other funding sources. And so they believe that the commission should only look at their legal services operation um, as far as constituting its budget um, in order to run the primary purpose calculation. 
um, in the statute that it says it looks at the entire organization, not just different, um, you know, units or components of the organization. So um, that was discussed with the organization as well. Um, there was also discussion about their other services um, and whether, you know, as we've been discussing, many of their social work services, for example, are under the auspices of the legal services unit. Um, my recollection is that they said no because they do kind of keep things separate um, within their organization. So in that instance, um, those services likely wouldn't be considered qualifying expenditures because it's not in conjunction with or under the supervision of um, an attorney. And so, um, you know, at the end of the discussion with that organization, there, there was essentially acknowledgement that they, they don't meet primary purpose under the current definition in the statute and the state bar rules, um, but that it was their position that um, given the uh, the way legal services has evolved and a lot of organizations taking more of this holistic approach um, that the nature of service delivery has changed. And so they wanted to submit that for consideration, um, but that they, they recognize that perhaps um, it would require either a, a new interpretation of the current governing authorities or even a statutory change. So, um, so the working group's recommendation was to find Catholic charities ineligible for funding um, given their inability to meet primary purpose this year. I have nothing to add to that. That was a <laughs> perfect recap. Great. Um, Bob, you have a question or a comment? Yes, um, I thought at the beginning of the summary presentation, you said that it was a 7%, is that right? Yes. That's so abnormally low, I, I can accept that um, doesn't meet primary requirements if it's only 7% regrettably. Thank um, you. Thanks, Bob. And yeah, I, <clears throat> I forgot to mention that, you know, even though 75% is the presumption, the commission has approved other organizations between 50 and 75% before, but to my knowledge, no organization that has fallen below 50% qualified expenditures has ever been approved for funding. There, there was one that was 49, but that was the unique situation, but. Okay. Yeah. No, 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 none that have been down at 7%. Yeah. Great, okay. Other comments or questions? It, would it be, um, my suggestion is that we go through all three and then do our motion at the end, if, unless anyone feels strongly otherwise. Okay, all right, well, with no, um, questions or concerns about that, why don't we move to the next one? Sure. Um, <clears throat> so East Bay Family Defenders, the working group for, for that organization was Herman DeBose, Jim Meeker, and Bob Plantold. Um, and Chris McConkie was also the, uh, I'm sorry, Crystal Bundang was the staff contact for this organization, um, but she's, she's out of the office at the moment. Um, so EBFD represents parents in dependency court proceedings in Alameda County. They are court appointed um, and provide holistic services in addition to legal representation. They have social workers on staff um, as well as peer advocates. They are uh, currently unfunded, but a returning applicant. Last year, they applied, had an eligibility review conference and were found ineligible. Um, the issue at that point was that they conducted no income screenings. Um, they used another organization that does similar work, but in a different county. They used um, sort of their uh, client percentage of qual income qualifying clients. Um, they applied it to their expenditures and tried to use it as a proxy. Um, and that wasn't found to be acceptable. So in, in response to guidance um, based on last year's application, they did start income screening this past year, but they only started in July of 2020, <clears throat> meaning that they would only have about half the year um, to do income screening. And then <clears throat> they've reported additional difficulties in successfully screening their clients. Um, I believe when they went back, they were able between July 2020 to June 2021 to only screen about 40% of their clients. Um, and the number that they arrived at was between 64 and 68% as income qualifying. Um, some of the obstacles that they reported were, um, you know, the nature of remote work during COVID that they weren't able to meet their clients in court where they typically would. Um, the fact that sometimes when they are first appointed, the client is not even present in court, and so they may need to try to follow up with them. 
Um, they have clients who may be experiencing homelessness or who are in the hospital and are just harder to reach by virtue of that. So, so they did articulate a number of reasons why in perhaps their situation, it would be more difficult to income screen than say a client who's coming to them seeking services um, at the outset. So um, the working group met with them and, and discussed those difficulties. Um, and you know, really there were two issues here. One was, was primary purpose. So if you accepted their estimate that they fell around between 64 and 68%, um, they wouldn't meet the presumption that, you know, as I said, there are other organizations that have been found to meet primary purpose below 75% in the past. But really the concern that came to the fore more so was, was whether they really had an accurate estimate of their qualified expenditures, um, just the actual number of, of expenditures in the past year. Um, and that's not that's because it's it's not just affecting that organization, but it goes directly into the funding formula and could impact the allocations of other organizations in the county in which they operate. And so out of a sense of fairness to um, to the other applicants um, who typically, you know, have close to 100 percent screening, um, it, it didn't have that same level of reliability or confidence for for the working group to feel that um, they had met the standard this year. Um, and so they were encouraged to continue working on improving their processes for income screening, which it sounds like they've already started implementing some of those and may be able to achieve that going forward. But um, at this point, based on the information that is available from last year, which is what the application is based on, um, the working group recommended EBFD is ineligible for 2022 funding. Thanks, Erica. Uh, Bob, you have your hand raised. Um, so, if we decide to follow staff recommendation and our own analyses, um, I want to point out this is an unusual time frame situation that they're not able to get the information for what seem to be various good reasons. I want to suggest, is there any annual report to the state bar and or the state legislature about a, a generic phrase like, here's problems, issues we encountered that we never thought of, and mention something about the difficulty of um, follow through careful detailed communication with clients during a time of COVID. And I'm saying that because with the resurgence of Delta and now a Lambda variant, we may be subject to masking and boosters for another year or two or so. I, I suggest that there be some sort of, if we say no, some sort of follow-up communication that higher authority ought to take a look at this. Not that we make a recommendation, just higher authority ought to take a look at this because it's beyond our scope to make any exemption or changes as we understand it. I'll leave it like that for now. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, it's an interesting issue of like how to have, you know, prove up the the requirements for the the statute when it's so difficult to do so under the current circumstances. And it sounds like this organization just has particularly a unique difficulty. Um, other comments or questions on this? Uh, uh, yes. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, Jim, let me have Catherine go and then I'll, I'll get you. I guess in the same vein, I just, I just wonder if there's some way to provide some technical assistance or to ask and you know, ask LAC to provide technical assistance about ways that other programs can gather information. I think it's it's really important to have the information and to have it be credible. And from my experience there, you know, I, I ran a large program. We had, we were statewide. We had people in a variety of settings, including psychiatric hospitals, um, but yet we had protocols by which we were able to get the information. So I just, I just wonder if it would be helpful to the program to offer some technical assistance and maybe look to lack or someone similar to provide it for to them to help them think think differently about the ways in which they could get it. Great, thanks, Catherine. Uh, Jim. 
Uh, yeah, um, unlike Bob, um, I wasn't as convinced that their problem with finding the income eligibility of their clients was so much due to COVID. It seemed to me uh, the history of it was that this program was originally run by the court and the court did the screening. And then the court contracted out to this organization to run the program and they stopped doing the screening. And the program just didn't take the screening issue seriously because when we denied them last year, and then again this year, the last two months they were able to collect the data, but they weren't taking it seriously before. So I'm not so sure that their particular problem was so much as COVID as it was not a primary goal of the organization to collect the screening data under clients. That's <laughs> personally how I felt. Anyway. Got it. Thanks, Jim. That's helpful context. Uh, not so much for this organization, but just uh, stepping off of uh, Bob's observation. You know, we made, um, we made allowances. There was a, a program that we had that had a break in. Uh, they, they weren't able to get access to all of the, the data that they needed. I think that within this, um, this rubric that we're living in currently with COVID, we may want to start looking at uh, what would be some of those allowances we want to provide for, for folks, if any. More a comment, Erica. Yeah. Thanks, Monisha. That is helpful. Brady? I was just going to provide for some context um, that that's not what this recommendation is based on, but I, I think that um, this is for next year, this might be an organization that, that we're looking at. Um, this is now, I think, the second um, conservatorship organization um, um, that, that we've looked at. Uh, the first one, I think, was um, Santa Clara, where we did fund it. And, and they had a very um, 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 convincing rationale of what they were going to be spending the money on, that it wasn't just going to be putting more money into the money they're already being compensated by the courts for. So. Um, this entire area is, is one that I think in rules we'll be looking at in terms of whether this is, should be considered a fee generating service since most of the work they're doing is, is, um, is compensated by a contract with the court. So that's you know probably not relevant to this, to this determination, which is just based on their um, failure to um, provide the documentation of indigency, but um, um, it, it might make everyone feel better that this isn't necessarily our, our core work that we're deciding to not fund on a, on a technicality. I see, that's a good point. I didn't realize that they they were like the other organization and funded by the court. So we won't uh, bankrupt them, I guess. No. Dawn? Yeah, I was just say that, that that's a little bit of a can of worms that Brady just um, threw out. And it is gonna be, um, the rules committee is gonna have to to, to, to make a recommendation because we don't technically right now, um, if it's funded by the court or funded by a government agency, we don't find that as fee generating. That's not how the, the office practice and the commission has found it. Um, but there is a, a, you know, a contrary reading, which Brady just, just uh, mentioned, but it is, um, <laughs> it's, 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 it's very sure. sticky. Yeah. Yeah. A I different discussion. That, that was not too, uh, it was, yeah, it was, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It was, um, not, relevant to the decision, but but perhaps to just uh, how everybody um, feels about making sure that these services are still being funded, and, um, that, that we're not. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any other comments or questions on this one? Okay. How about we move to the last one and then we can do the motion all together. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the last one is Community Lawyers, Inc. Um, the working group members were Louise Fightmaster and Zahira Mann, um, and Chris McConkey was the, the staff uh, person assigned to the, the application. Chris, do you wanna, would you like me to, or would you like to get the recap? Oh, I'd be happy to. Um, yeah, uh, good morning, everyone. Chris McConkey, senior program analyst. Um, yes, this ERC was on July 29th. Um, the working group and staff met with the executive director at Community Lawyers Incorporated and their grant manager, or rather their interim executive director, who's also a board member and their grants manager. The primary topic of the ERC was whether or not Community Lawyers Incorporated or CLI 
has quality control procedures that are approved by the State Bar of California pursuant to Business and Professions Code Section 6213A1, which is the definitions um, provisions. Um, the um, uh, sort of related to that was whether their staffing levels and structure, like do they have enough staff and, and is the way that supervision plays out sufficient to meet the quality assurance expectations and the standards for the provision of civil legal aid, which are the guidelines that the commission and state bar have adopted um, for quality control procedures. So as a, they've applied before, so as a reminder, CLI and, and have yet to receive funding um, for Ailton EAF. And as a reminder, they're in the city of Compton, they serve LA County. They primarily coordinate pro bono legal services um, as opposed to offering in-house legal representation, primarily coordinate pro bono services for clinics and immigration and family law with the immigration uh, clinic um, being a little bit more hands-on and, and at brief services and, and um, limited scope representation, um, the client kind of comes back over and over again. The family law clinic is a little more of like a self-help style clinic. They'll, they're all pro per litigants. They'll come in with their paperwork and the family attorney will help them complete it. So that what triggered the assessment for um, quality control procedures is that they have only one paid attorney who is their half-time interim executive director, and then they have a full-time program coordinator or services coordinator and a grant writer. So with only a half-time um, attorney who's also performing administrative functions, is there sufficient attorney oversight to ensure high quality, safe and effective pro bono um, clinics and referrals. So the working group and staff met with them, really dug into those questions um, and ultimately came to the conclusion, um, and I would encourage the working group members to jump in here, um, that because it's a rather small program, they served about 470 clients last year, um, and all of their cases are sitting in two clinics that have experienced attorneys that oversee them, and it is the attorney themselves that are providing the services then the family law attorney is an experienced family law practitioner and the immigration attorney is an experienced immigration law practitioner, that because it's a pro bono model and it's a small program, that it is indeed um, uh, very possible that they are complying with the standards for the provision of civil legal aid's expectations for very small service providers. And this, you know, they, the working group, I think, took to heart that the, the standards are guidelines and the standards themselves, the ABA standards themselves, um, say that for very, very small providers, you know, these standards aren't one size fits all criteria, um, but rather it needs to take into account the sort of reality of what it means to have like a one attorney or, or a half time attorney with two pro bono attorneys delivery model. And so this working group found that it is indeed very likely that they are meeting these quality assurance um, expectations. Uh, so the recommendation is to find them eligible. Um, the reason they were um, ineligible last year um, has been resolved. They um, failed to submit a complete and timely application last year, including a qualifying um, financial review from an independent CPA, but they did do that this year. Um, and then there being no other red flags in their application, the recommendation was to approve. Thanks, Christopher. Uh, Louise, you have your hand raised. I think make a clarification on what Christopher said on the family law piece. My understanding from them was that the, the, the person who filled out the paperwork was not an attorney in the office. It was a staff person or a paralegal type person. And that that person then forwarded the paperwork to the family law attorney who's outside the organization, who then reviewed the paperwork, you know, and okayed it or not. Um, and I had a little issue with that just because, um, you know, asking the right questions is more of an attorney job than a paralegal job to get the paperwork done correctly. Um, but I still agree with the recommendation. I just wanted to make that clarification. Okay. Thank Thanks, you. Louise. Um, other questions, comments? Um, I, I just have a question. We... Do we know or did we check no no disciplinary issues with um, the organization? They haven't had any complaints or anything against them. You mean filed with like the state bars like complaint unit? Yeah, I just I mean, we're worried about whether they are providing safe and effective mm -hmm. legal services. I just wanted to see if we had confirmed that there's been no complaints, so at least with the state bar. 
I might be wrong about this, but I think those complaints are walled off from the Office of Access and Inclusion, unfortunately. Is, is that correct, Juan? Like we, um, we I, don't, I can't access those records. Yeah, I, you know, I, I don't know about that. And I, I we, but we didn't affirmatively um, go to the OCTC and check. Um, if oh, they sorry. Were, I'm not even asking for okay. you to do like the special confidential complaints. I'm just like, did we check on the website? Like the ED or, you know what I mean? Like that, that there's like, there's usually at least like there are publicly available complaints if they are determined by mm -hmm. the, by, by the state bar to be egregious enough to warrant like a public complaint. I was just curious if we had checked that. Sorry, okay. I wasn't ex acting, asking you guys to okay. go. Sorry, I, we, we, we don't typically, and that, that's okay. probably a good idea. Like we, I, and I don't know if Kristen, but I, I didn't um, instruct the staff to physically put in the name of the ED into the attorney search and, and do that, but it's, it's, it's not a bad idea. Yeah, uh, sorry. It was just a question because I just, given the that was our why we were talking yeah. to them. Anyway, there is no a big deal. question in the application that asks if there's a finding. I can't remember okay. exactly how it's worded, but they they need to upload that to us. A, okay. A, I can't remember like for, for finding from where, but there is something that gives us like a, a little bit of a catch all. Got it. Okay. I was just curious on that, Catherine. Um. I so I I actually think that that was an interesting discussion. I. I feel like there's such a lag between the time that a complaint is filed about a specific lawyer and when the bar gets a finding, like that information is going to be three years from now and not that helpful. I, I did think it's like an interesting question, like while not maybe knowing the specifics of has a complaint been filed against an organization for at least an inquiry. So, you know, that there's a complaint there or not under the other. So, you know, People can file complaints saying I was dissatisfied with the services provided by this legal services funded organization and the bar actually inquires of the program about those. So maybe that gets picked up in the question that Dwan asked, uh, says is there, um, but maybe not. So that, that's just something to think about for the future, I think. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to open a can of worms. It was just one of those. That's interesting. <laughs> yeah, Zira? Thank you. And I don't know if uh, Duan's response kind of gets to the last question, if she wants to go go first. I, I, I was just going to, uh, sorry, I was just going to say, uh, sort of related is that um, we are developing um, a complaint process um, that we're going to bring to the commission but for our grantees. But, but I do think this is a really interesting topic about other um, uh, applicants, but I think we should put into, again, rules committee um, to kind of look into, because that's it's, it's yeah. a really good, really good suggestion. So. Yeah, and just to, uh, sorry, I had to jump off and respond to something else. So just apologies if I've, I'm repeating anything, but as far as a, a disciplinary complaint made against a, um, a, a individual attorney, um, that attorney won't find out about it um, unless uh, the, um, the Office of Chief Trial Counsel finds that um, that right. the, alleg the, the allegations um, basically that it, that it launches an investigation, and generally speaking, um, um, the uh, the disciplinary process the State Bar doesn't deal with competence. It's it's very rare that a, a competence complaint um, would lead to an investigation because you have to have either reckless, repeated, or intentional um, right. um, failure to provide competent services. Otherwise, your your um, your um, your avenue for a remedy um, as a client is is malpractice. And so right, I, sure. You're right. I, I was I was more just wondering right. if we had made any check on that kind of question, given the quality control concerns. But but we um, do have a you know the state bar rules do provide for a complaint um, um, to uh, to the Legal Services Trust Fund Commission, and I oh. think what Don's speaking about is is sort of looking at beefing that up and formalizing it more. Yeah. Makes sense. I was, sorry, Susie Hira. Thank you. Um, and thank you everyone for the discussion. You know, I just wanted to um, just be, because I, I do think um, the question that you're asking is, is a very, you know, helpful and useful one um, as we think about like quality of services. And one of the things, um, so Louise mentioned the piece in terms of the family law portion of the work um, where that portion of the work in terms of the review, the volunteer who's reviewing, she shared, 
is someone who is not staffed at the organization. So they're a board member who's a volunteer who's doing the review. And so even as we kind of think about some of these pieces, like the executive director, the attorney on staff isn't also reviewing those aspects of the work. Um, this is, you know, as was shared before, like very specific because of the size of the organization um, and the number of people who are part of it. But, um, you know, I, I think based on the way that they're, 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 they're set up, um, while it sounds like we're putting a process in place, there are aspects of the way that this organization functions where we might not even kind of catch some of those things unless we're kind of reviewing it from the executive director perspective and who are the various volunteers and whether or not those volunteers have had any disciplinary action against them. Um, but thank you for the, for the question. I think it's, it's helpful. Thanks, Sahara. Chris? Uh, um, yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna add, and, and this is a, a bit um, subjective, so I'd encourage like um, Erica or Dwan or, or Zahira or at least to, to like come up with more nuanced language, but the, um, or to better capture the sentiment of the working group. But I think my, my impression, that there was a sense that um, it was on the basis of spoken assurances that they gave during their ERC that like quality assurance was just meeting the level that the working group felt comfortable cautiously greenlighting this, but that we would want to pay very, staff ought to pay very careful attention to this program if it gets funded in its very first year, like maybe visit a little earlier than we might otherwise visit and really make sure that those assurances were true. Um, like there was no reason to think that that they were they were false in any way, but just, you know, like it was it was a lot of um, sort of the the interim EDs like spoken um, description of what the quality control, quality assurance procedures were that were, were enough to give the working group and staff comfort. Um, but we wanna make sure that it actually is playing out that way on the ground. So I, I would offer that. I don't know if maybe anyone would characterize it slightly differently, but that was my impression of the group sentiment as far as like recommending funding. Thanks, that's helpful. Dawn? Yeah, and our plan is to, um, for, for this one, all the new grantees um, go, we have a monitoring visit scheduled the first year. For this particular program, we'd like to do in the first six months um, in case there are issues that we can help them, um, you know, remedy on the earlier side. Yeah. I mean, all of that makes sense. And, you know, obviously there's, as we're all aware, like, you know, not all complaints are substantiated. So I didn't mean to like open a big can of worms on that. I was just <laughs> curious on that issue. Other questions, comments on this um, organization? Okay. Um, I it seems as if based on the questions or, you know, kind of lack thereof that we are, are in general um, planning to, you know, ap uh, approve the recommendations from the various working groups so that Catholic uh, legal or Catholic charities would be non-qualifying, East Bay family defenders would be non-qualifying and, or not, not, ineligible, sorry, ineligible, ineligible, and then community lawyers would be eligible is every anybody feel differently want to speak to it being a, a different okay um so with that can we put together um erica or Dwan? do you guys want to put up a, a motion just so we can see it if that's okay yes just because it's got three parts And this, this is the form of a, it takes the form of a recommendation to the commission as the commission will make the final determination. Right. I don't know if you wanted more detail regarding sort of the aspect of community lawyers um, approval or. Um, I like the simplicity uh, <laughs> yeah. of the wording. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I understand that we wanna do the monitoring visit within six months, but I'm hesitant. Well, I'll defer to the working group, but I, I, I will say I'm hesitant to put it into the motion because I want to allow staff the flexibility in case things come up um, where it's in the seventh month or something. Um, but Thank if you. we feel, if anyone feels that it really needs to be in there, then I will defer. 
I, I would suggest not to for that for that reason, Erica. And um, and we've never been more detailed in this level of discussion because we, um, I mean, for the motion because there's a memo. So I would suggest leaving it at this this high level for the motion. Okay, Sierra. Thank you. Um, you know, my only comment would be with respect to like what's in the memo. Um, and to the extent we don't have some of that information within the memo related to the fact that this was um, kind of on the, the edge, then if there's a way to augment the staff memo to include that piece, I don't think it would necessarily impact the motion, um, but just to be able to document that. So in future years and while the monitoring visits are going on, um, we have a sense of, of what was discussed. Yeah, could we maybe um, one way also, whether we can amend the memo or if in the minutes from this meeting, we can put in um, details about the verbal assurances and the fact that it's kind of uh, borderline. Juan? And we also for, um, Zahra, just so you know, um, for the, the ERCs, for all the ERCs, we do keep um, detailed notes that, and if they haven't got to you yet, they will at some point to you so that we have a record of it. But but yeah, I, I think we memorialize it in our um, our action summary um, would be great. Great. Okay, does, um, with that discussion, does anybody wanna make the motion? I'll make the motion uh, as set forth on the screen here that we adopt these recommendations. Great. Second. Great. Thank you. Um, Colleen? Yes. Applauding? Yes. Fightmaster? Yes. Bennett? Yes. Blakemore? Yes. 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 Beltino? Yes. Uh, Ma'am? Yes. Meeker? Yes. Plantel? Yes. Savage? The measurement passes. Great, thank you. Okay, and then, um, oh, we're getting close to the end here. Um, we, uh, what's our next, our next thing is about recommending applicants to the commission as eligible and ineligible. Um, I think prior to that, Juan had an update um, oh. regarding the increase to, to EIF funding in 2022 and, and a possible proposal regarding um, spending down those funds. So Juan, did you want to provide sure. an update? And I apologize, this is coming to you um, so late because the, the budget, um, as you all know, I sent out the email, the governor signed it um, last month. And so we've been kind of looking at the legislation and looking at the increase and seeing, um, you know, how to build out and provide programs with more flexibility. So obviously the, the additional funding is, is a welcome, welcome news. Um, it is qu quite a bit of money. So um, the staff proposal um, would be um, to allow, because the, the statute actually allows this, is to allow the programs um, to spend the, the, make a budget proposal for two years for the increase, e just EEF, not IOLTA, the EEF funding, um, and the programs that can spend it more quickly or have already an immediate um, need and can gear up and hire um, can, can do a budget proposal for one year. Um, so again, I apologize for bringing this um, to you so late, but we had to make sure, check with Brady, make sure that that was fine with the legislation and make sure um, you know, all our I's and every T's were, were crossed before we brought that. And also with our Smart Simple, we wanted to make sure that we could build that out and we have gotten the okay from our tech team that um, we can tweak the application to allow programs to build it out a two-year budget. So we, want, we wanted to bring that proposal to you with the hopes that you would approve that recommendation and bring it forth to the commission um, later today. Catherine? I raised my hand and forgot mute. Um, I think it's actually really important and allows for a good use of the money over a longer period of time. And so I will make a motion to support the staff recommendation. Sorry, my only, um, before we do that, is there's no issue with this not being on the agenda and us taking a vote on it? I checked with Brady. We could tuck it into the outstanding um, issues because I know oh. we didn't. Um, so I did check with Brady. And okay. Then, 
and on the commission side where um, we can, there is an agenda item that Brady felt comfortable that it could, it could, it could be included. Okay, perfect. I just wanted to make sure we were covered on, yeah. on that issue. Okay, yeah. sorry. So I'll second, Catherine. I'll second Catherine's motion. Great. Um, Tommy? Yes. Ekwagi? Yes. Shitemaster? Yes. Bennett? Yes. Blakemore? Yes. Spouse? Yes. Bofino? Delfino? Um, Friedman? Mann? Yes. Meeker? Yes. Antold? Yes. Savage. The motion passes. Great. Okay. So now, um, now we'll move to the um, recommendation regarding the eligibility and eligibility findings. Yes, so um, just to recap the process, because there have been a lot of um, decision points along the way over the past three months. Um, this year for 2022 funding, we had 108 applicants initially. Um, two organizations withdrew, so um, the committee's been looking at a total of 106 applicants. Um, there were six new applicants, uh, as we just discussed, three of them had eligibility review conferences. Um, the other three, their applications presented no, um, no eligibility concerns um, based on staff review. And so um, staff has included them with the list of, of eligible applicants or recommended eligible. Um, I, I don't remember, I believe I mentioned this briefly earlier, but um, we are also recommending that um, family legal assistance at Chalk Children's be found ineligible for 2022 funding because uh, they failed to submit a reviewed financial statement. And after meeting with the chair of the committee um, and discussing the application requirements related to that, as well as some of the other um, you know, evaluations and other documentation that needed to be provided, um, that organization's response uh, was that they weren't going to be able to comply in time in order to submit a complete application. And so they they stopped um, on their end proceeding with the process. Um, the reason we're recommending them as ineligible is because they haven't officially withdrawn their application. So um, it's our understanding that it was their intent not to to be found eligible. They, they stopped about um, in early to mid-July, but um, that is the reason that they're recommended as ineligible. So, um, Based on that, 103 applicants in the list you were provided in the materials are recommended as eligible, and three are recommended as ineligible, being Catholic Charities, Diocese of San Diego, um, East Bay Family Defenders, and Family Legal Assistance at Chalk Children's. Okay, great. Um, any discussion or questions before we move to the motion? Okay, seeing none, does anybody want to make a motion? Move to accept, recommend the list. And thanks, Bob. And, and to the extent that anyone has conflicts, um, you can abstain as to particular organizations. Just make sure you say when you do it, but that doesn't prevent you from approving or negating the motion otherwise, okay? Right, I think I have that correct. Okay, any second? I'll second it, Erica. Great, thanks, Bonnache. Thank you. Um, Connolly? Yes, but I'm gonna abstain as to CLESPA. Akwagi? Uh, yes. Whitemaster? Yes. Bennett? Yes. Uh, Blakemore? Yes, abstaining as to Disability Rights California. Uh, yes. Delfino? Yes. Friedman? Ma'am? Yes. Meeker? Uh, yes, abstaining with Public Law Center. Uh, Plantold? Yes, but abstain if Bay Area Legal Aid is on this massive list. Um, and Savage, that motion passes. 
And, and Erica, sorry, I also want to just um, abstain as to Disability Rights California. Okay, thank you. And I, I again, on this massive list, if uh, Silicon Valley, um, mm -hmm. I need to abstain as to that one. Great. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, sorry, <laughs> family stuff going on in the background. Um, uh, great. So the motion passed. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And then I think there was an update on. Yes. Um, so we just wanted to, so. yeah, um, just to provide a, an update on an aspect of the, the application this year that sort of came into play and hasn't really been a, a major um, factor in prior application cycles. But um, I believe some of you may have been on the committee at the time last year when 2020 budgets were approved, um, or I guess two years ago now. Um, because of the very large increase in IELTA funding that year, um, organizations were, were allowed to use more funding than perhaps they typically would towards things like capital additions or paying down their, their mortgage. Um, and so we had three uh, grant recipients who were approved um, to do that. Actually more were approved than that, but other organizations revised their budgets. So the three organizations that actually went through with it were Greater Bakersfield Legal Assistance, um, which paid down their mortgage, uh, Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles, which um, was doing enhancements to their building and architectural assessments and uh, construction, and then um, Legal Services of Northern California, which also paid down its mortgage. So um, the reason we're mentioning it here is because the way the application works is organizations report their their IELTS and EAF expenditures in the prior year, net of their capital additions. Um, and so the reasoning for that part of it is the state bar um, retains a reversionary right in that funding. Um, so it's in our current provisions that we can ask for that funding back in the future. Um, and in the case of at least two of the organizations, it wasn't actually included in their expenditures. Um, it had been converted into an asset. And so um, it'll be depreciated over time, but wasn't an expenditure the way you would normally see it listed in their expenditures this year. So um, since it wasn't an expenditure, we took out the part that they spent on their capital additions um, from what they reported as, as their IL-10 EAF expenditures. In the case of one organization, they did expense it um, this year. And so um, the way we reconciled with them was we had them deduct what they spent on their, um, their capital additions uh, in the application so that it would, um, the calculation would run correctly. But um, this isn't like a, it is an aspect of the application that, you know, um, is a little bit more technical. Um, and it's probably the first time in years that we've actually encountered uh, needing to implement it. But um, I just wanted to, I guess, mention that uh, that was sort of a one aspect that um, we dealt with this year with the applications. Thanks, Erica. Is there any? Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Dwan. Yeah, we just wanted. I just wanted to add because we wanted to bring it to your attention because um, with the the capital edition, some of the request was a very large amount, and so. Um, you know, we the we went through the analysis. And there was a, I guess, an alternative way to do it. So we wanted to bring it to your attention to make sure that you were comfortable with how we handled it in terms of um, that, that net of capital additions on the instructions. Um, What's the alternative I, interpretation? The, the alternative is um, for some part, I mean, you, you might not um, allow them to count it like a depreciated over time. So you would have them deduct it all, um, all right now. Um, but we went with um, how they, consistent with how they've um, reported it in their audit. Is that correct, Erica? Am I describing yeah. it correct? Yeah. So that, that's the approach that we took. Got it. So they'll be deducting it of smaller sums over however long period of time. Yeah. And just the a, a reversionary interest, the, the, I think it's in the grant provisions that says um, the, the commission may exercise that, that right. Um, from my understanding, you haven't in the past, and this is something that we'll definitely need to, to look at, take a closer look to see if we want to exercise that, because um, like Erica mentioned, um, 
uh, prior to that, that 2019 increase, programs just never contemplated using it for capital additions because resources were so scarce. It always went to the delivery of, of legal services for clients. So there was never even, it, it, that it was on the books, but that, that, that option was never exercised. So this is now coming up because of that, that, that large increase. Um, the, the, the fee programs. And so it hasn't quite played out like this before in the past. So we, we, we try to look back and see historically, but it just, it hasn't, at least all the documentation, um, you know, from, from our office, um, we don't know how it was handled. I don't think it came up before because of those reasons. But again, because they're large amounts of money, we wanted to make sure that you, you all were comfortable with that approach. And this was, um, this came to our attention very, very, um, very recently also in the review process, or else we, we would have brought it to your attention earlier. Thanks, Dwan. Uh, Bob and then Catherine. So during this oral uh, staff report, we heard that um, it's the commission that seemingly, according to the report, would make the decision. Staff did not ask this committee to make a recommendation. Are we being asked to ratify staff actions and or recommend to the full commission? Or was staff delegated authority responsibility for making somehow um, such a, a decision? It, so the prior expenditures were approved by the committee and the commission. And then as far as how it's accounted for in, in the application, it's, it's part of the application. We didn't build that in this year. Um, it is just that's how it's treated in the application and has been. It just doesn't come up often in terms of organizations actually using funds for these purposes, but it was already in, in the application itself. So my question is like, it sounds like you're saying you're gonna you're going to lessen or claw back some money. No, I think Bob, the issue is how do they report these capital these these capital additions because they don't qualify as they're not qualified expenditures, um, and so how do you deduct them? And the issue is do you, you make them deducted in one lump sum or over time? And staff has, and it sounds like this the application allows for over time because that's how they do their depreciation and their accounting. Um, and they're just informing us in case there's some concern on our end. And then there's one person who, or one organization that actually expensed it, but you guys had them take that back out so it wouldn't be included in their qualified expenditures. So all of this, I think, is, is something that we haven't had to deal with before, and they're providing us with some information. But it sounds like these are all practices that are sort of in our, in our general way of doing things we just haven't had to do with them before so it's more of a staff report about accounting procedures yes exactly <laughs> they, that would have been a lot simpler to have as a prefatory edit. you didn't you didn't get that from depreciation no i'm just teasing <laughs> we wanted to make sure you're comfortable because um yeah we wanted to be overly cautious because the other time that we thought it was a technical cleanup was the pass-through issue um and so we didn't want to make a unilateral um decision uh, to us it's technical but we we wanted to, to keep you all informed in case that sure. wasn't your understanding because of what happened with pass through okay yeah. Catherine you have your hand raised thank you so I'm, I'm grateful not to know about the pass through problem so we'll just skip over that um but the um so do our programs aware of like how this is now going to be accounted for and I guess has a program raised a concern that that we should be aware of or everyone's good and you're just reporting to us about the approach and there's no concern. We haven't, um, as far as I know, received any um, any concerns raised by any of the um, organizations that are uh, implicated. Yeah, we haven't received any concerns, but it's a, it's a highly, highly technical issue. Um, I mean, we pretty much have implemented what was in the application instructions, and that says, you know, net report back out of IELTS and EF net of capital additions. 
So they've done that, but then in some instances, like this one organization um, expensed it right away. So, so then there was like more clarification and then, then we did a fuller analysis this past week um, to see, make sure that we're dealing with it consistently or you know, in this instances, um, where, where we're going with how they have decided to do it within their audit. Um, the, the, this will, again, I hate to say this, but the codification committee will probably need to take a look at um, capital missions and how this gets moved for, dealt with moving forward as more programs um, will likely try to exercise um, the option of, of, of utilizing um, funding for capital missions improvement. Um, but it's highly technical though. Um, so I, I don't know, if, I think we haven't like sent out an email to let all the programs know, it was only implicated with these three programs and we've had a conversation with each Yeah, that, that's okay. I, as long as I just like, I couldn't tell with, so it seems like you're consistent with the application instructions, yeah. programs either did or have now acted in a way that's consistent. Mm -hmm. It's over a multiple year period, which is allowed. And so it seems fine. It just yeah. actually just wanted to hear Kind of that piece so, no. thank, so thank you very much exactly and the one piece that's that is a bit outstanding is the reversionary piece that because we've never exercised it we don't quite have a process we haven't as far as we you know erica i've been here six years erica three years so i don't know in the past um whether um the, the staff has brought that to the commission and say in this instance i don't know if it's been presented like that because usually it's um, if they're then going to sell the property or they're no longer a grantee. So I don't know if there's an opportunity to even bring that to the commission, but it is something we should, probably should think about what our protocol is. If you want to exercise that right in the event that they, they sell that building, do we, want, do, we, do we want that funding back? We don't need to tell them that now, right? No. It's only, and they will tell us if they sell the building, right? Well, I, I don't know if they'll tell us. I, that's that's uh, the problem. We don't, we're missing that process. A step. I mean, I think there's yeah. questions about how long does the revisionary interest last? Yeah. And yeah. Like, I, anyway, I just, I think it, it makes sense for it to go to the rules, but yeah. it was the rules committee to like wrestle with that with some smart accounting people to advise. Yeah, yeah the entire policy around capital additions um, needs to be reworked. It's, it's really outdated and, and, and nobody understands. It's very, very um, abstract and dense. Fun. Okay, Ed, is there anything that you need on a, a vote from us or anything? We don't need a vote. It's just like on our, our side, it was um, administrative. Um, again, we just wanted to provide you that report to make sure you're all comfortable with that. Yeah, I mean, uh, without, unless, you know, I, I it sounds appropriate. And unless an organization is, thinks there's something inappropriate, I'm, I'm inclined to think it's appropriate. And I, I will see what other people say. Um, okay. Any other comments, questions on this? Yes, hearing none. Um, anything else on our agenda? No. Okay. We got done 15 minutes early. Thank you, everybody. Good discussion today. Thank you to staff as always for getting a, getting us super prepared for everything so that we can hustle through. And, um, we now have 15 minutes before our next meeting. And thank you all, and we'll see you in 15 minutes. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you.